Мы входим в эпоху глобальных изменений. How the energy prices are going to react to the changing demand and pressure from the technological sector. We are opening new, new supply chains to the east. We are producing polymers with high added value. By exploring northern territories and developing polar projects, and by using smart systems, we are replenishing the resource base. We are building new logistics corridors, overcoming external challenges. We are prioritizing several projects which in future might be used to transport promising types of energy, clean and safe energy, as well as the development of alternative energy technologies creates standards for a new model of technological development for industry. It creates challenges, but at the same time opens up new opportunities. New opportunities to allow for disruptive development of the industry and tapping its uncovered potential. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the Russian Federation, Vladimir Putin, and the moderator of the plenary session, Hedley Gamble. Good afternoon, Mr. President, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Russian Energy Week. It's the 20th anniversary of this forum. We're all very pleased to be here. Thank you so much for having me. My name is Hadley Gam. NBC's senior international correspondent and anchor based in Abu Dhabi. I'd like to introduce our panelists at this point, Patrick Piani, he is the CEO of Total Energies. We've also got Darren Woods. He's the CEO of ExxonMobil, the CEO of BP, Bernard Looney as well, and the CEO of Mercedes-Benz and the chairman of the board of Daimler, Ola Kalenius. Gentlemen, welcome and thank you so much for joining us. We all face a very uncertain future. The UN has essentially said that global warming is not only a code red for humanity, but also a red alert for the planet. And at this point, all of this is coming against the backdrop of a global energy crisis. We have supply chain disruptions globally as well. We've got international security threats with the Taliban back in Afghanistan. We have rising geopolitical tensions in the South China Sea. We've also, of course, got the prospect of inflation as well as potentially stagflation. And as one CEO in this audience said to me, central banks have been printing money like confetti, at least so far. So a lot of things to get through. At this point, the big question, of course, is how are we going to continue to meet the needs of the world's growing population, 9 billion people by 2040, and at the same point, avoid destroying our planet? I'd like to invite the President of the Russian Federation, Mr. Vladimir Putin, to speak. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, greetings to all the participants and guests of the Russian Energy Week. Moscow once again welcomes the heads of the leading energy companies and groups, prominent experts and specialists. They are gathered here today to discuss the current status and prospects of global energy, its vital trends, and undoubtedly, they are gathered here to suggest mechanisms for long-term stabilization of the energy market, which is crucial for the very complex situation that we find ourselves in, just like our moderator here just stated. Energy sector has been severely affected by the 
crisis caused by the coronavirus, when due to lockdowns, the slump in business activities, halting of production and transport traffic all over the globe, the global demand for energy has drastically shrunk. And I guess that all present here are very aware of that, because that has hit your companies as well. As of last year, the global primary energy consumption has decreased by 4.7 percent. That was the result of the biggest shock for the sector in the last 70 years. Weaker demand led to changes in prices compared to 2018. The prices for natural gas in Europe last year plunged 2.5 times. In 2020, it stood at $130 for 1,000 cubic meters, in 2019 at $159, and in 2018 at $282. As for the oil sector, the situation we all observed was truly unique. Nobody actually could believe their own eyes and could imagine that when in the spring of last year, oil prices for the first time ever in history turned negative. It was more expensive to store oil than just to pay for somebody to use it. That was a truly unique situation. OPEC plus agreements were key to stabilizing the situation on the oil market. OPEC members and countries not part of the OPEC managed to cooperate efficiently with one another to ensure the resilience of the oil sector during the coronavirus pandemic and what is especially important to create enabling environment for investment because in case of underinvestment into new fields and into future production the market would inevitably be faced with a massive critical deficit very very soon and we are seeing echoes of this today now when the global economy is recovering and oil demand has rebounded, our countries are also stabilizing the market and the prices. Timely and expeditiously, we are increasing our output and boosting deliveries. Russia is a responsible member of OPEC+. Plus. We believe that the agreement would be in force until the end of the next year, 2022. At the same time, the current results show that the cooperation between our countries has the potential for further development. It can span across additional areas, such as exploring new environment, environmentally friendly technologies of hydrocarbon extraction and refining, the exchange of best accounting practices, and lowering carbon footprint. Unlike the oil market, the gas market, first of all, European gas market does not look to be well balanced and predictable. The main reason is that not everything on this market depends on the producers. No lesser role is played by the consumers of gas. And I can say a couple of things that perhaps in this very expert audience might seem evident and even trite. However, in recent times, uh, various officials tend to forget about them altogether or ignore them. They substitute thorough analysis by hollow political motives. So what am I talking about? Over the last 10 years, the share of renewable energy sources in European energy mix has soared. That is a good thing, on the one hand it started to play a very important, a very significant role in the energy mix. Well, thank God, but the main distinctive feature of this sector is the variability in energy production. We need some serious reserves should there be a disruption in generation, for example, due to a change in weather, and sometimes those reserves might not even be enough. This is exactly what happened this year then due to a drop in wind turbine output on the European market, we saw the deficit of energy. The prices have surged and that in its turn triggered a rise in gas prices in, on the spot market. At the same time, what is important is that 
gas consumption depends on the season. In summer, its stockpiles are traditionally replenished before winter. However, this year, even after the very cold winter in Europe, many countries decided against it. They have hoped for spot gas deliveries for the so-called invisible hand of the market. And considering the high demand, they have thus drove the prices even further. Once again, higher prices on gas in Europe are a consequence of a deficit of energy and not vice versa. And that's why you should not deal in blame shifting, as we can say. This is what our partners are trying to do. Sometimes you're hearing people talk about this very topic and you're surprised at that, quite shocked, as if they totally ignore the numbers. They do not see what the situation really is. They're just trying to rectify their own mistakes. Over the last 10 years, step by step, systematic flaws were introduced into the European energy system, and they led to a massive energy crunch. I can remind you that back when nuclear and gas generation were the leading energy sources, there were no crises. There was just simply no way such crises could occur. I would like to add that in Russia, such problems are impossible to imagine these days. long-term approach to the development of fuel and energy sector allows us to ensure the lowest level of energy prices for the population and companies compared to the European prices. For example, the average price in euro in Russia is around 20 euro for megawatt hour. In Lithuania, it stands at 256 euro. In France, 300 euro, and in the UK, 320 euro. Energy bill rises are strictly limited and regulated, contrary to European countries, where due to higher energy generation prices, energy bills in recent times have soared almost every single month. I have the information, but I'm not going to tire you with the exact numbers. Going back to the situation on the gas market, I would like to add uh, a few words. We often hear that high prices playing to the hands of commodities producers allows them to have surplus revenues without any visible effort. Although those who support such an opinion do not understand what they are talking about, they prefer not to plan ahead, not to take into account long-term prospects, and they are quite clear, including for the producers, a sharp, multifold increase in energy prices forces companies, economies, and utilities sector to drastically increase their expenses, drives down energy consumption and lowers energy generation. Accordingly, high prices may actually have a negative effect for everyone, including for the producers. And our producing, producers, including those present here today, understand that very well. For any market, stability and predictability is important, and Russia flawlessly fulfills its contractual obligations to our partners, including our partners in Europe. We ensure guaranteed uninterrupted gas deliveries to Europe. We have all the reasons to believe that by the end of this year, we will reach record levels of gas deliveries to the global market. Moreover, we are always trying to meet our partners halfway. We are prepared to discuss any additional steps. We've been consistently working on strengthening energy security of uh, the entire European continent. And together with European companies, our partners and friends, we are implementing a number of major infrastructure projects, such as Turk Stream, Balkan Stream, the Nord Stream 1, Nord Stream 2. And their goal is, for years ahead, to ensure reliability and predictability of gas deliveries in the volumes required by European countries. I would like to add that the implementation of these projects leads to a multifold drop in greenhouse gas emissions. And now some more additional information. Carbon intensity of Russian natural gas deliveries uh, along the Nord Stream 1 is three times lower than the American LNG, just for you to compare. At the same time, 
we need to negotiate the global mechanisms for balancing the energy market. We need to launch a substantial detailed dialogue between the energy producers and consumers, free from any political load or enforced cliches. We are talking about very important issues which define the work of companies, organization, and define the welfare of households of millions of people, both in Russia and in our partner countries, including countries in Europe. I'm sure that during such a dialogue, we can find solutions which would take into account market trends and interests of all parties. Distinguished colleagues, one of the main factors defining the long-term global energy development is beyond debate, climate change. Russia is fully aware of how acute the challenges in this sphere are. We can see and feel all the threats and risks, both for the humankind, for the planet, as uh, I have just said, and for our country as well. And uh, in this country, the average annual temperature has risen 2.5 times faster than the global one. And over the past decade, it has gone up by 0 0.5 degrees Celsius. And in the Arctic, the temperatures are growing even faster. Russia has been supporting international climate initiatives. We have been honoring our obligations, and in the upcoming decade, we intend to ensure that the greenhouse gas net emissions are lower than in the European Union. And these, dear colleagues, are not just empty words, it's a direct guideline to follow. We have been implementing a number of projects that have already yielded results and will do so for many years to come. Russian oil gas companies have been burning less APG, and uh, I would like to reiterate, I have said about that at one of the meetings, our indicators are the best ones. We have been launching projects to capture CO2, and we have been transferring to higher technological standards. We have been doing big job to upgrade electricity and residential and utility sector, and we will continue to support these initiatives. Russia has great potential to increase energy efficiency, which is estimated at one third of the current energy consumption. And in this regard, I'm tasking the government with the updating of the state program called Energy Saving and Raising Energy Efficiency. We have spoken about that at the meeting with the government. There is a need to extend it till 2035 and double down on all the sectors of the national economy, including industry, agriculture, transport, and utilities, in order to achieve ambitious goals to bring down the GDP energy intensity and thus the adverse effect on the environment. I would like to add that Russia has taken practical steps to make its economy net zero. And we have been setting concrete targets here. We'd achieve it no later than in 2060. I will reiterate what I have already said. Fighting climate change is our common task, the task of the humankind, and difficult, hard, big work is ahead of us. We will involve a wide range of experts, heads of companies and civil society groups and states. However, the climate agenda should not become a tool for promoting economic and political interests of some countries. Together, we should develop a unified, clear, just rules of climate regulation, which will be global. They should draw upon a real focus on climate and understanding every country's role and contribution with the help of mutually recognized models of accounting and monitoring of greenhouse gas emission and absorption. It is important to follow the principles of technological neutrality. I mean, we should be objective, taking into account carbon footprint of different types of generation. If you know uh, that, uh, for example, the footprint of uh, nuclear energy is lower than that of solar energy, I think uh, that even those uh, present here, maybe experts here, um, about that for the first time. And Russia has a unique uh, practical experience of developing and long-standing use of nuclear technologies, including fast neutron reactors that will allow us to transit to closed fuel cycle in the future and use small nuclear reactors more broadly. And by the way, 
a floating small nuclear heat and power plant uh, has been successfully put into service uh, in Chukotka, northern part of our country. And drawing upon our achievements in this sphere, we'll continue to export nuclear technologies and thus make our contribution in the decarbonization of the global energy. Beyond debate, the key role to solve the global problem of uh, the greenhouse gas stock uh, should be played by climate projects, including those tapping into the potential of natural ecosystems. And Russia has indeed unique opportunities to offer. And the effectiveness of these projects in our country has been much higher than that of the investments uh, into the development of European renewable energy. And in order for in order to implement such initiatives uh, to facilitate the work of business, we need to, to create conditions uh, to bring investment into the projects uh, that uh, would give high returns on the investment. And uh, evidently, there should be no place for uh, different uh, sanctions or other limits uh, in climate project implementation. And the current situation shows that climate issues should be solved together with making plans for developing different economic sectors and primarily the energy sector. And experts estimate that within 25 years, the share of hydrocarbons in the global energy mix will go down from the current 80-85% to 60-65%. And at the same time, oil and gas will play a less important role. And my colleagues from Russia sitting here in the hall understand it very well. They take it into account and bear it in mind. And uh, a more environmentally friendly transit fuel, which is gas, uh, will increase. And I'm also talking about the LNG production. By 2035, we intend to drive up its production up to 130 million, million tons a year, and we will reinforce our position and this market uh, taking 20% of it uh, thanks to low production cost, price, and competitive logistics. I would like to point out that today the LNG is the main cargo carried uh, via the Northern Sea Route. Moreover, by 2035, um, we expect to increase our role and our share in the global petrochemical supplies uh, from 1% to 7%. I would like to add that in the upcoming decades, uh, we will see a stronger hydrogen and ammonia positions uh, in the global energy, and we know about it very well. They will be used as raw material fuel and energy carrier. And Russia has uh, scientific uh, resource and logistic capacities to take a considerable share in these prominent and promising markets. At the recent economic forum in Vladivostok, uh, I have already said about that, and I urged uh, colleagues uh, from the Asia-Pacific region to cooperate in this sphere. And I hope that our partners from Europe, the United States, and other countries will also respond to this proposal. Dear friends, the ramifications of the pandemic and the shock that the regional energy market were exposed to once again showed that what important role stable and sustainable fuel energy system have played in today's world how important it is to provide consumers with affordable energy and to minimize the negative impact on the environment and to ensure the energy and environment security. Forward, all actors of the market should take forward-looking, well-balanced, responsible actions. And I'm referring both to producers and consumers in the interest of sustainable development of our countries and peoples. And Russia is ready for such creative and trust-based cooperation, including to direct dialogue um, with the European Commission for the search for common solutions to stabilize the energy markets and fight against climate change. I'm convinced that together we will definitely achieve results in solving these complicated issues. Thank you. Mr. President, thank those remarks. Um, we're going to just take a moment to hear from the chair of OPEC. Um, the president of Angola is joining us. Your Excellency Vladimir Putin, President of Federation of Russia. Your Excellency, President of the Russian Federation, Vladimir Putin, distinguished forum participants, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for inviting me to participate in the Russian Energy Week 
This is the forum that raises issues which are not only relevant for the hosting country, but to all the nations where oil and natural gas production make up the main fossil fuel energy source. Angola is uh, a nation like that, given that oil and gas are the main sources of national revenue. Today, Angola produces approximately 1.3 million barrels of oil and 76.4 million cubic meters of natural gas per day. Despite the fact that uh, a number of international oil companies uh, work like operators in Angola, there is also a place for other investors, and this is particularly true of, for free zones and new sedimentary oil basins where hydrocarbon potential has yet to be fully uncovered. Angola has restructured its oil sector and established two organizations, which is the National Agency for Oil, Gas and Biofuels, which is responsible for providing concessions and regulating prospecting and production operations. And there is also an oil derivatives regulatory institute which regulates downstream operations. Meanwhile, Sun and Gold Group is continuing to work on increasing added value in the oil sector. And areas of focus in this regard include searching and prospecting for crude oil and natural gas, as well as uh, assessing, developing, extracting, refining, transportation, storage, distribution, and sales of petroleum products. These are also key branches of Sun and Gold Group's operations. Work to develop deposits and extract hydrocarbons is mainly restricted to crude oil. Nevertheless, given the need to unlock the economic potential of Angola's natural gas reserves and to put an end to burning the gas, the Angola LNG project was launched. The construction of this liquefied natural gas facility was done in partnership with Sun and Gold Group, Chevron, BP, NE, and Total. In order to effectively capitalize on gas hydrocarbon deposits and to bring about economic diversification, the Presidential Decree Number 7-18 was adopted on the 18th of May 2018. The decree establishes a legal and tax regime for activities related to searching and prospecting of natural gas, as well as assessing, developing, extracting, and selling. The aim is both to boost gas production and to boost the development of related industries. In this regard, steps are currently being taken to establish the new gas consortium with the aim of producing non-associated gas, and this will allow for uninterrupted supplies of gas running to Angola LNG facility, and then the combined cycle plant in CO and to manufacturers, uh, manufacturers of fertilizers. A number of other initiatives aimed at diversifying the Angolan economy are also underway. The developments of uh, the gas sector is opening up a range of opportunities for Russian companies, given the experience in this sector. They could, for example, support efforts in steel production, fertilizer production, energy production, and more. In addition to that, the government adopted a hydrocarbon production strategy for the period of 2020 to 2025 in what was the first stage of the production cycle of the oil and gas sector. This strategy aims to collate a large volume of geological data and provide access to all resources at Angola's sedimentary basins in order to restore and increase oil reserves. In order to increase production of petroleum feedstock in Angola, the government adopted a strategy of licensing new oil blocks for the period of 2019-2025. This strategy outlines plans to issue permits to develop more than 50 blocks. In addition to that, the government has put in place a and block supply regime to complement and bolster this strategy. 
This regime aims to support work related to ongoing sales of license blocks for which concession agreements for development have yet to be issued and free zones of concession blocks and concessions belonging to the National Concession Award Service. Opportunities for Russian companies are also opening up in this area. In order to ensure self-sufficiency in terms of refined petroleum products, the government is promoting three oil refinery construction projects in Cabinda, Soyo and Lobito. Once these refineries are complete, Angola will benefit from a refining capacity of about 425,000 barrels of crude oil per day. Russian companies have the chance to invest in the construction of the refinery in Lobito. And right now, the, an international tender is underway um, for an equity-based partnership, and the process will close in October this year. The petroleum industry creates greenhouse gas emissions, uh, which are contributing to global warming. And in this regard, the Angolan government urges all those involved in developing deposits and producing oil and gas to take steps to reduce and compensate for environmental damage. These include the rational use of energy resources and planting new forests and restoring old ones, so afforestation and reforestation. There are many other measures as, as well. Today, the climate is undergoing rapid changes and there is a growing concern over the state of the environment. And given this, the transition to a low carbon economy is a priority on the agenda of many countries around the world. Angola must should follow the example of other countries on this matter and develop a national strategy aimed at sustainable production of fossil fuels and gradual reshaping of the national energy mix over the medium to long term. In doing so, we should create opportunities for the development of new renewable energy sources such as solar, wind, energy, the use of biomass and many other energy generation facilities. In this regard, Sun and Gold EP is working in partnership with ANI and Total Energies to construct two solar power plants in the provinces of Namib and Wheeler. And the company is also looking into the possibility of producing biofuels and hydrogen. To sum up, I would like to highlight the major contribution made by the Russian Federation to help to train Angolan technical experts in the oil sector. And uh, we continue to cooperate in this area, which is very important uh, uh, for Angola to achieve further socioeconomic growth. Once again, uh, I would like to express my gratitude for inviting me to participate in the forum. And I would like to state that Angola is interested in strengthening ties with the Russian Federation in this area, as well as man in many others. Angola is open to all the companies keen on investing in the diversification and development of the Angolan economy. Thank you. That was the president of Angola. Um, Mr. President, in your remarks, uh, you just were mentioning about what's happening in the gas crisis. I think it's really interesting that we could pick up on that. Um, you mentioned blame shifting. Uh, you talked about hollow political motives. So much has been said and so much has been written in recent weeks about what's been happening. And I want to ask you about it directly. Has Russia been using energy as a weapon? Russia is not using any weapons. If you have been paying attention, as for economy, where we are using weapons, weapons in what conflicts we are taking part. As for economy, this is not something we tend to use. Even during the hardest parts of the Cold War, Russia regularly has fulfilled its contractual obligations and supplied gas to Europe. By the way, back then, your fellow Americans were trying to fight this very project, pipelines for gas, and back then the leaders have insisted on actually implementing this project, and this project continues to be used for the energy mix in Europe. And this is what I call a politically motivated blather. It has nothing to support it, 
when it comes to saying that we use energy as a kind of weapon. Look at what's going on right now. Europe is extracting uh, 54 cubic um, million cubic meters of gas per year, and um, its number is falling in Europe, in the Netherlands as well. And Gazprom produces more than 500 billion cubic um, meters of gas per year, and they are going to increase that number because they have reserves of 35 trillion cubic meters of gas. And if you would look at it in general, then Russia's reserves are practically unlimited. And we are expanding our supplies to Europe. Even in the very complex conditions we live in today, Gazprom has increased its supplies by 10% to the European countries. And overall, the increase stands at some 15%, including LNG because LNG also grew by 13 to 14 percent. And we are prepared to continue doing that. We have not seen any single case when our companies would refuse to answer to the demands of our partners who wanted us to increase our supplies, even during the very harsh winters of recent years, when our partners wanted us to increase uh, the supplies, even beyond the contracts that were in place, we were doing that. And we are doing that right now. We see the number of requests, and then we answer to those requests. I would like to draw your attention to one more fact, that the supplies of American LNG actually moved from Europe to Asia when the prices were right. And out of the overall volume that could be supplied to Europe, and that stands at 14 billion cubic meters of gas, I'm talking about LNG, but in gas terms, almost half of it was undersupplied by American companies. So actually, who? is using those energy tools for their own purposes, Russia or someone else. We are increasing our supplies, while partners from other countries, including the US, are actually decreasing their supplies. This is open information. You can just look it up on the internet. You can find it all there. And you are talking about Russia being accused of using energy as weapons. This is utter nonsense. This is politically motivated blather that has nothing to support it, no foundation whatsoever. That's it in general. The benchmark, though, is up nearly 600 percent for the year. It's taken several months to get to this point, several weeks of a price surge globally. I mean, at the end of the day, I guess the question is, how can you expect Europe to believe you're a reliable energy partner when you're not supplying that energy via the pipeline? A beautiful woman, but I'm saying one thing to you and you are saying a different thing to me, as if you have not heard what I said. But at the same point, it took you guys long enough, did it not? You said that you are not supplying gas over pipelines to Europe, but actually you are mistaken. You are mistaken, and all those who feed on the information they receive, we are actually increasing our supplies to Europe. Gazprom at 10 percent, and overall Russia at uh, increased uh, our supplies to Europe at 15 percent. We have increased our supplies over gas pipelines. We have also increased LNG supplies by 13 percent. We are increasing, not decreasing, our supplies to Europe. And other suppliers have decreased their supplies by 14 billion cubic meters, and half of that is due to the American suppliers. 
Is that not clear? We are increasing, not decreasing the supplies. And if we are asked to increase some more, we are prepared to increase some more. We are increasing the supplies as we are required by our partners. There is not a single refusal to answer to the increasing demand. We are also increasing our supplies um, to Turkey over the Blue Stream. The Turk Stream, we are increasing our supplies to the Balkans through the Turk Stream, etc., etc. We are increasing the supplies over the existing routes, even through Ukraine, and the increase through the Ukraine transit hub beyond the contracts that we have would stand at 10 percent. We cannot increase it anymore. We are being hinted that you should increase the supplies over Ukraine, but it's dangerous to increase them because the equipment has not been uh, repaired for decades. And if we would increase the supplies, then it's just going to fail. And Europe would be left without any gas. It's, uh, at, the equipment is 80 percent outdated. We, they do not want to hear us. They just want to blame Russia for something. Who is they, your European partners? Well, those who do not wish Russia well, they can be in Europe or in other countries of the world. Okay, walk me through this. Essentially, the markets are looking um, for uh, some sense of stability here. Are you saying that in terms of increasing supplies to Europe that you would get at current capacity increasing by as much as 15 percent? The IEA says that could calm the markets. Well, I've said that we've already increased these supplies by 15 percent by now. Over the first nine months of this year, the supplies of gas to Europe have been increased by us by 15 percent. But the thing is, the problem does not consist in us. It consists uh, in the European side because, well, first, uh, we, we know that the wind farms uh, did not work during summer because of the weather. Everyone knows that. Moreover, the Europeans did not pump enough gas into their underground uh, gas facilities. Just 75 percent, that is very little. Everyone understands that. Everyone knows that. And the supplies to Europe have been decreased from other regions of the world. We have increased the supplies, but others, including the U.S., have reduced their supplies. And this is the cause of the panic. Part of the gas is deposited in the Ukrainian underground storage facilities. I may be mistaken. I do not have the exact figures, but around 18 billion cubic meters of gas has been pumped into the Ukrainian underground storage facilities. But most of that gas does not belong to the Ukrainian operators. Most of this gas belongs to European operators and private companies, and we and our partners know what is happening in the Ukrainian energy sector. Let's remember 2008, when we couldn't do anything about Russian gas that was back then. That was the cause of the crisis back then. We were demanding that they give us our gas, and they didn't do that. Right now, there are some irresponsible politicians in Ukraine who say that they need to nationalize the gas that is stored in Ukrainian underground facilities and that does not belong to them. And what are we witnessing right now? We see that the gas is taken away by foreign operators from the facilities where it's stored in Ukraine. We can supply more, but we need requests to do that. As I've told you, we increase the supplies as much as we are requested to. They've requested 15 percent by now. If they ask more, then we will supply more. So we do everything we have to under our obligations, and we are willing to supply even more than that. But we need some 
foundation for that a request, we, we cannot simply do that on our, on our own volition. And there has not been a single case when we refused such a request. These things will come at a cost. Can you assure us that there'll be no price gouging? Well, you see, this is a very important issue. I, would, I just said recently, this uh, particularly goes about the previous composition of the European Commission. They were demanding the establishment a European hub kind of a stock exchange for gas. And they thought that such a free market could ensure a balance. And we always tell them that we need to look far ahead based on long-term contracts because the pricing is different as far as long-term contracts are concerned and short-term one because a long-term contract is tied to the price of uh, crude oil and also to a number of other products like gas oil. There is no secret about that. But this is a market-based pricing system which I'd like to reiterate is tied to the oil prices that are set by the markets at the global level. And no one gives any directives with regard to, to this price. It's set in a market fashion. And moreover, there is a six-month lag which allows the operators to understand what is happening and to make the necessary adjustments that might be required. Whereas the sport market is different. It all depends on a number of factors which are very hard to anticipate or predict. There are many factors of unpredictability. Let's take a winter, which is cold and long. The wind farms didn't work, not enough gas in the storage facilities, the prices have gone up, and mark. Uh, gas has been rerouted to Asian markets. So these are the factors which explain this situation. But Gazprom does not get any money for, for, for such big prices, because Gazprom sells the product based on the prices that tie are tied to oil prices. I think uh, it's 82, $81. And this is the price to which gas prompts gas is tied. They do not get gas at $2,000 per 1,000 cubic meters. And Germany gets this gas from Gazprom at 250 to 230, maximum $300 per 1,000 kilometers. And Gazprom uh, basically is losing because it could get more if it traded at spot prices. But the producer, Gazprom in this particular case, is interested in this stability because they know that they will sell a certain amount, a certain volume of gas at a certain price. And this allows them to shape their investment policy, which is beneficial both to the producer and to the consumer. 800 million people who are facing a very, very cold winter. What's a fair price? If oil is sitting above 80. Well, as I said, this just price cannot be set by decree. It's dictated by the market itself. Let's look at what happened last year when oil prices went down last year, the year before that, and the gas prices went down accordingly. And as they say, well, Gazprom was in a tight spot. Uh, the production went down, and the profits, and the net profits too, went down. When the oil prices started to creep back up, 
the revenue started to grow as well. But Gazprom is not speculating on the price of uh, gas in Europe. And I would very much like everyone who uh, follow this meeting uh, hear that Gazprom does not get $2,000 per 1,000 cubic meters like uh, at the London Stock Exchange or elsewhere. No, uh, it supplies under long term uh, contracts. And uh, well, German clients have to be very happy because uh, they get gas at a better price. And this has uh, an effect on the economy and the competitiveness. Hey, though, a, a big question has been surrounding, as you were mentioning, um, the blame game. One person that has not cast the blame on Russia is, of course, the outgoing Chancellor of Germany, Angela Merkel. She has advocated that you continue to use Ukraine to supply gas to Europe beyond the commitments of 2024. Can you commit to that? Well, uh, it would be an exaggeration to say that she is not blaming Russia for anything, because we have divergent views on many issues and many problems. Okay. Uh, well, as far as Nord Stream 2 is concerned, you are right. She's never blamed Russia, because she and I have always assumed that this is a purely commercial project which is not politically motivated, and like what the opponents of the project have uh, claimed, they have always been saying that this is not a commercially viable product and that Russia is pursued not only due to political motivation, and that is why Russia is uh, building Nord Stream 1, 2, Tech Stream. But, you know, this is yet another piece of nonsense, and I'm going to tell you why. First, the uh, gas distribution network of Ukraine was uh, constructed based on the assumption that there was only one region of Russia which was producing gas, the Uringai gas field, which has been exhausted stage by stage. And that is when we shifted production northwards to Yamal Peninsula. And that is when and where we started to build a new a gas distribution network, and it's been two decades now in the making across Russia, and from there we build new export routes, and that is where Nord Stream 1 and 2 come from now, moving on to economic viability and political motivation. Just please pay close attention to what I'm saying. This route is 2,000 kilometers shorter and quicker to get to our main consumers in Europe than via Ukraine. 2,000 kilometers more efficient. So it's cheaper because transit is cheaper. And it's also cheaper for the end users because the transit fee has to be factored into the end price, in particular for the European consumers. So it's shorter, it's cheaper. And moreover, it's modern equipment, and there are better pipes that can uh, uh, send gas at higher pressures, and gas pumping st stations are more modern as well. And in order to push gas forward, they also use gas, and there are emissions. And you know, the emissions for these new gas pumping stations are more efficient five or six times more efficient than in the Ukrainian gas transportation system. So when someone says that there is some political rationale behind that, they simply close their eyes to some obvious facts, precisely for political motives. Nord Stream 2, as well as Nord Stream 1, are purely commercial projects. And this is the position of the outgoing chancellor, and I fully agree with her. So will you extend your commitments to continue with the flow of gas through Ukraine beyond 2024?
Это тоже чисто экономическое. This is also a purely economic issue. I have told you that the wear and tear of the gas transportation system of Ukraine, according to different estimates, is at 80 percent, 85 percent. And in order to preserve this transit, let alone increase it, which is what we are doing despite our political differences, this year we have increased that by another 10 percent uh, more to the obligations, uh, uh, we would very much like them to, to be grateful. And instead, they're only criticizing us more. But in order to increase that, this system has to be modernized. And uh, this goes uh, not just for us, it concerns us and also European clients and the Ukrainian operators. Secondly, we need to understand how much we can sell, because this is a very important issue. And I told that to Chancellor Merkel. She has always uh, raised that issue. And in response to your question, I can say that we are willing to preserve this contract. Moreover, if the economic and technical, technological conditions are there, we are willing to increase the volumes. But we need to understand how much they're going to buy from us. I anticipate there are going to be questions about the environment, about the transition to a low carbon economy, to uh, uh, carbon footprint reduction. If Europe is abandoning hydrocarbons and gas in particular in the end, in future, so how can we commit ourselves to increase transit via Ukraine if Europe stops buying gas from us? Just tell us how much you're going to sell, uh, you you're bu buy. Let's uh, make a deal. Then we will understand how much we will be able to pump via the northern route, via tech stream, how much we can maintain via the Ukrainian route or even increase it. We need to understand the volume of the market. And if Europe tells us that they are simply trying to abandon high carbons, but at the same time, time they say that after 2024, we need to continue pumping gas via Ukraine. I don't understand where that comes from. Well, let's sit together, look at the maps, make the calculations. If uh, we're ready, yes, we are ready to do that, but we need to calculate everything to, to look into that. Your Deputy Prime Minister um, was suggesting last week that moving quickly with the regulatory hurdles, getting them out of the way before allowing gas to pass through Nord Stream 2 would actually, at least in the medium term, assuage the gas crisis that we're seeing in Europe. Have you had any indi indication from Europe that that is moving more quickly, that we could see Nord Stream 2 come online at a sooner date? No, on the contrary. We see that the administrative hurdles are not removed, and there are different issues related to the third energy package in Europe, the third package which governs in particular this project. There is a number of details. I do not want to go into these details right now. But these administrative hurdles are there. So far, they have not been overcome nor removed. I'm aware that there is a discussion on Nord Stream 2, in particular with the German authorities. The German regulator has to make a decision. So far, the decision has not been made. So we, we, we could supply more via this route. And if we could do that, we could be sure that this would significantly pacify the uh, European gas market and it would have a serious effect on the uh, gas prices in Europe. But so far, administrative hurdles prevent us from doing that. Let's now, Patrick Poyani, it's great to have you joining us virtually from another room in this building. Um, I want to ask you to just follow on to the president's comments there. How damaging? is the gas crisis that we're seeing that's engulfed Europe and has now hit China and the rest of the world um, to your business and do you think to European growth as a whole? 
Yes, uh, good afternoon. Happy to be back in Moscow, even in our room. I would say that first, uh, I would just uh, comment that um, it's not a European gas crisis that we are facing. In fact, gas markets are worldwide interconnected. All is coming from a huge hike of demand for gas from China and Asia, Japan, Korea. Why? Because there is more demand for gas because of energy transition, going from coal to gas, which is good for climate change, and also because there is more requirement from climatization from middle class in China. There was also this year some events like less hydro and less uh, coal cap capacities of production, which have increased a lot the Chinese demand. So the president of the Federation of Russia is perfectly right when he said that, in fact, and we are producing LNG, you know, we are the second largest total energy producer of LNG in the world, so we are producing LNG in the US, and it's clear that this year, because of this hike in demand in China, higher prices came into Asia for gas, and all the LNG from the US, most of it went to Asia because the European market was lower. So that's the fundamental reason why then in Europe you have less gas coming into the system, not from Russia at all, but in fact from the global market. And the Europeans must, must understand that with LNG development, we have fundamentally interconnected all the market. And so it's not a question of what is only the demand in Europe, it's what is the demand for gas globally, and in particular in Asia. And there is a good news for all gas producers, uh, it's that there is a growing demand, and in particular for LNG. Uh, again, we are managing total energy 10% of the LNG market per year, so we are very aware. And there is a growing market, more than 10% per year in the last seven years. So it's why also we see this increase. So everything is connected. And I think, uh, does it damage? Yes, it's not good. Uh, high pricing is not a good news. Uh, of course, immediately for my company, our results are better, but for customers, because we, we are looking for developing gas again, and particular in order to substitute gas to coal, which is good for climate change. Uh, but to do that, we need to have a, low, a lower price, because coal today is a king, because coal is cheaper than all the other sources of energy. So for us today, prices are too high. We need to find stability, uh, going back to something more normal. But I would like to comment that most of the gas market today is based on long-term formulas. We, Total, I think to this week quarter, we will sell our gas 85%, around 9 to $10 per million BTU, not 20 or $30. This is only the spot market. And most of our large corporations, in fact, have edged their, their supply. So, uh, I would, so we, we need to differentiate in this crisis what is the spot part and the massive, the longer term contract, which is most of this gas market today. So yes, today it's good, but uh, I hope. Uh, but it depends, of course, of the weather as well, because if winter is cold, we might have these high prices during winter time. But again, it's not the interest of the producer. The interest of the producer to develop gas market, in particular in Asia, is to come back to lower prices and, in fact, to convince our customer that the best is to have longer-term formulas which stabilize more the impact of the spot, in fact, which are more based, I would say, on what we had in the old times S-curve. So that's, I think, uh, a lesson. The other lesson, let me be clear, is that the more we put renewables in our electric system, we put intermittent sources which depend on the weather. So this year, the markets of energy is hit because there was a freeze, a big freeze in February in the US, less rain in China and Brazil, less wind in Europe. I don't know why all these events appeared, occurred, but this has, I would say, lower all the uh, uh, inventories on gas, and so we see today an exceptional circumstance and I think that after winter time, we should be able to come back to uh, uh, better prices and lower prices, which would be good for everybody.
Thanks so much for that, Patrick. I'm going to bring in Bernard at this point. I mean, when you think about this with regards to BP, we understand that the EU, of course, is talking about proposing legislation today. They're going to roll that out in Brussels, which would essentially require um, that uh, all oil and gas drilling would be stopped in the Arctic and that there would be um, an inability to bring those products to market. Obviously, that would impact Total Energies. That would impact uh, BP, potentially. Um, how worried are you about that? Uh, good evening, and it's uh, great to be here in uh, in Moscow as well. Um, thank you for including uh, BP in the conversation. I think what this um, crisis in in Europe, uh, with regard to prices, has reminded us, if we needed reminding, is that you know energy is uh, part of the lifeblood of society, and that energy use is only going in one direction uh, in this world, and that is uh, upwards. Now, as we look at that, Hadley, um, I think one of the things that comes clearly out of this uh, is what we would call redundancy uh, or reliability. Energy must be clean, yes. It must be affordable, yes. But it must be reliable. And we all understand that uh, the sun doesn't shine at night, that the wind doesn't always blow. So we have that uh, question of reli renewables intermittency to deal with. Uh, but as Patrick just alluded to, we also have uh, global issues that have come together at this time. Um, rain, lack of rain in Brazil in a hydro economy has meant that a lot of LNG uh, has gone from America to Latin America and not to Europe. Uh, massive demand post-COVID uh, in Asia has meant that um, a lot of LNG has had to go there. So it has been an unusual confluence of events on the back of very cold weather, in particularly April and May in Europe. And that means that we have the situation that we have. Now, to your question, what do we need to do uh, to do this? Well, we need to invest. Um, and what do we need to invest in? Well, we need to invest in redundancy. And what does investing in redundancy look like? It looks like investing uh, in long-term contracts in which we participate uh, ourselves throughout the world. It means investing in uh, natural gas, because natural gas is a key balancer in the system, a key provider of redundancy. It means investing in uh, storage, uh, and storage capacities have uh, dropped, and it means investing in diversification of energy sources. So these are the things that need to be done to make sure that we have a system uh, that has redundancy built into it for a system that isn't just a nice to have, it's an essential uh, to our way of life. And that's what we're trying to do in BP in terms of our strategy, uh, but that's what needs to happen, uh, I think, throughout the world. So a ban on Arctic drilling for oil and gas is not something that worries you? Bernard? So a ban on Arctic drilling by the EU is not something that worries you? The, the, the issue that we need to address here is an issue of uh, demand. I think the issue of supply is well documented. Uh, we are all doing what we can uh, on the supply side. Uh, but at the end of the day, if supply goes away and demand uh, doesn't change, that only has one consequence, and that is an escalation in price rises. So I'm not suggesting that the uh, onus needs to be put on customers or society. But this is a system, and both the supply and the demand side need to work together. Just simply correcting a supply side issue without affecting uh, demand will not result in a more stable system. It will result in a more volatile system. And quite frankly, anything that's more volatile is typically not in the best interest of society. Speaking of volatility, um, Patrick mentioned China. Um, President Putin, in the past, you've said uh, that China and Russia agree on a number of issues. You're very close in terms of your priorities, both regionally and globally. Um, I just want to get a sense of how you feel about what's been happening of late in terms of rising tensions in the South China Sea. Uh, President Xi has reiterated that it's the historic task to complete the reunification of the motherland, that it must be fulfilled. And of course, he's talking about Taiwan. When you think about this a bit more broadly, if China were to invade Taiwan, would you say a real risk of war?
Well, if you've been following what the leaders of the People's Republic of China have been saying, you might have noticed that in one of the latest speeches where I have personally been present, that was an international event in the framework of the UN where I've been present. And I remember that President Xi was saying that the People's Republic of China has no plans to use military power to resolve any type of problems or conflicts. That was more or less his statement. That's the first thing I wanted to say. Secondly, as far as I understand, the Chinese philosophy regarding the philosophy of statehood and state management, it does not include use of force. And thirdly, I think China does not need to use force. China is a huge, powerful economy, and in terms of purchasing parity, China is the economy number one in the world ahead of the United States now. And by increasing this economic potential, China is capable of implementing its national objectives. And here I do not see any threats. As for the South China Sea, yes. Indeed, there are somewhat conflicting and contradictory interests, but the position of Russia is based on the fact that we need to provide an opportunity for all countries of the region without interference from the non-regional powers to have a proper conversation based on the fundamental norms of international law. It should be a process of negotiations. That's how we should resolve any arguments. And I believe there is a potential for that, but it's not fully used so far. In terms of that response, obviously three and a half trillion dollars of global trade flows through the South China Sea every year, and almost as much as uh, in terms of oil as the Strait of Hormuz itself. So it's considered an international waterway. When you talk about external powers, those that are not regional, are you referring to the United States? Well, I'm primarily talking about those countries that are not part of this region. When you think about this a bit more broadly, President Xi has, of course, um, taken drastic measures to um, address this energy crisis. He's essentially said they should buy gas at any price. Obviously, there's a lot of uh, conversations being had about whether or not China was going to be able to stick to their goals in terms of the climate change agenda in the face of this rising crisis. How damaging do you think it will be uh, to the green energy agenda if China is forced via this crisis um, to move away from their goals. Well, you're asking me questions that I can't answer. I'm not President Xi. I'm the president of the Russian Federation. And I can't tell you what are the plans of the Chinese management, but I only know what they do. And that also includes cooperation with Russia. First of all, China is the largest trade partner for Russia. And despite the decline in the global economy, the trade turnover between Russia and China is increasing. And in nine months of the current year, it has exceeded $100 billion. And that is a very good indicator for us. We can even set a record for this year. And in this regard, China is a highly reliable partner for us. And I'm not talking about political components of that. I'm talking about China being a strategic partner of ours in almost all areas. And China is truly a reliable partner and an ally. And China is delivering on all undertaken commitments. And if there are any questions, be that in the economic area or in any other area, we always sit at the same negotiating table and we search for solutions. And we do find the solutions by making compromises. The same applies to, co to cooperation in the energy area. China works with us to develop one of the largest projects on the LNG, by the way, together with uh, Total Energies, with Novatec. And that is a successful project. That is Arctic LNG. The second project that China will also most probably participate in. Together, we have agreed on supplies of gas, of pipeline gas to China. We have constructed the pipeline route and the total volume that we're aiming to achieve is 38 billion cubic meters. China is a huge market and a rapidly developing and growing economy with a very large amount of consumers. And I believe today we have generally agreed on the second route going through the territory of Mongolia. 
But I've been saying that before. If we relate to the supplies of coal, China has large coal generation, and the leadership of China is taking large effort to eliminate and go away from coal generation. 1.5 billion people live in China. It's not that simple to do. It's not a trivial task. They need to protect the interests and the needs of their population, and that's exactly what they are doing. And they have a very careful plan, very balanced plan, to decrease the carbon footprint. And the same applies to the transition period when more of blue fuel will be consumed, more of gas. And it is now planned to increase the gas supplies through the available infrastructure and also in terms of the ones that will only come up in the future. I do not know whether China will be able to deliver on all the plans that it is setting itself because the volumes are huge, but everything that has been done by China in terms of achieving the goals that they set, it was all delivered properly. Really, literally everything, be that economics, they've achieved everything, and that gives us hope that also in terms of decreasing the anthropogenic load and the carbon footprint, they will achieve the goals that they set themselves up to 2060, as far as I remember. China delivers. I want to bring in Olaf just because I think you have to leave us very shortly. When we think about what's happening with regards to climate change technology, how quickly that is evolving, um, we've seen obviously this report from the IEA today essentially saying that not only are governments going to have to and corporates going to have to increase threefold the spending on green energy, they're also of course going to have to continue spending on traditional fossil fuels, on oil and gas. How does that impact your strategy when it comes um, to going to electric fleets? Good afternoon. The automotive industry is in a full transformation towards zero emission mobility. And it is three main things that is driving this change. I'm going to start with technology and innovation. Uh, the progress that we have seen on electric drive, uh, battery energy density, uh, and all the features that you need to provide a competitive product compared to the incumbent technology is moving so fast that we believe this is the decade where that technology in its own right uh, will probably overtake the incumbent technology. And that's usually what drives the change and leads to eventually exponential growth in, uh, in an industry change. The second part of the equation is the regulatory will. And it starts with the Paris Climate Agreement that most countries have signed up to. If you translate that into uh, a plan for us, uh, we have made a commitment as Daimler, as Mercedes-Benz, uh, to achieve a net uh, zero position in 2039, so about 10 years ahead of the 2050 Paris Agreement goal, uh, to also allow for a shift over of the car park. And the last thing is uh, actually the capital markets. Uh, it will be increasingly difficult for automotive OEMs to attract capital from long-term investors unless you have a credible uh, decarbonization plan. So uh, already today we can see on our major investors when we meet and speak with them that unless you present a plan towards electrification and for the heavy vehicles, we're also uh, using hydrogen uh, and, and fuel cell drive, uh, they are not uh, looking at your stock as, a, as an attractive stock. What's going to decide the speed of the transformation next to these technological developments is very much something where industry and governments need to work hand in hand, and it's build up of infrastructure. It's going to be a Herculean task uh, to change over uh, the major economies in the world to a full-fledged omnipresent infrastructure for charging and also where necessary for uh, hydrogen fueling. And then next to that is what the discussion is about here today. How quickly is the energy transformation going to go and how quickly are those energy sources for the mobility sector going to go CO2 neutral? So many things are working hand in hand here, but we are seeing, we're seeing momentum picking up. And if you would ask me two or three years ago, I would have been uh, more conservative and more skeptic. Now I believe that we need to go faster as a car company, and in this case, a luxury car company like Mercedes-Benz with the customer profile that we have. I think we can take a lead and maybe go faster than the general market. That leads me to a question about the oil market. Mr. Putin, do you believe that we're going to see oil at $100 a barrel? Well, that is quite possible. 
currently the oil prices are growing. And speaking of Russia and our partners and OPEC Plus Group, I would say that we're doing everything possible to make sure that the oil market stabilizes. We are trying not to allow any sharp peaks in prices. We certainly don't want to have that. It's not in our interest. We fully comply to our commitments regarding the uh, reduction of the oil output. Those are difficult decisions to make. Those are difficult for our economies, for our companies, because unlike other basins, I would say that in the Middle East, the oil production is happening in the difficult climate conditions. And in order to reduce the oil production there, it takes some additional effort that means additional costs. But nonetheless, we are making those steps, and the market has been stabilized as a result of it. By the way, a major positive role in that was played by His Excellency Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia and the King of Saudi Arabia, and actually the ex-president of the United States, Donald Trump. And I'm saying that with complete openness, because I myself have been participating in those trilateral negotiations. And there is no politics behind that, trust me. President Trump was just representing the interests of American companies and was fighting for those decisions. And although the United States were not participating in this work directly in the operations of OPEC Plus, nonetheless, the United States, taking into account the producing companies in the United States, have impacted this process. And we have managed to stabilize the market and save a lot of workplaces and jobs in the United States as well. Market has been stabilized, but we still have not achieved the pre-crisis output 11 million barrels per day. And our position is that we need to increase the output gradually as the demand grows. And my colleagues are seated here in the front row. Those are CEOs of the Russian companies. We certainly take into account the budgetary interests of Russia, but also the interests of the largest companies. We act based on the negotiations we have with them. And the fact that we have reduced the oil output finally has benefited the world market as well. It has become more stable. The prices have somewhat increased. And it was also in the interests of our companies because their revenues have increased as a result of the changes in the oil prices. And that was also favorable for the Russian budget. So I would say that everyone benefited from that. We're not trying to retain uh, the output to for the prices to skyrocket the way it is happening in the gas market. We don't want that. We want to have a balanced development. I heard that former President Donald Trump called you directly about prices and about the oil market, trying to get that OPEC plus deal done. Do you have the same relationship with the White House today with President Biden? Has he contacted you as a member of OPEC plus? No, uh, we have not discussed those issues with him, but we are in touch with the U.S. administration and generally I believe we have a fairly stable relationship with President Biden. As you know, the Under Secretary of State is now with a visit in Moscow, and she's discussing it with her Russian counterparts, the subject of further contacts with President Biden. So I would say we're having constructive relationship with the current administration. The latest Pew Research poll says that 44 percent of American Republicans want President Trump to run again in 2024. Would another Trump presidency be good for the energy market? Well, this is something that does not relate to us, and I don't want to provide any kind of assessment like this. I've been saying that before the U.S. election, before the election of President Trump and after, and also after the previous elections, I've been saying that we are ready to work with the President of the United States that is elected by the U.S. citizens. We are not giving any assessments. I'm only saying that the fundamental interests of uh, both countries in terms of security and reduction of the strategic weapons, combating terrorism, um, money laundering, uh, also combating with tax, tax havens, stabilization of energy markets, those are 
objectively important things for us where our interests coincide and undoubtedly that will result in the fact that the relationship between our two countries will get better and the U.S. political establishment will finally stop speculating on the U.S.-Russian relationship, trying to damage their own interests and the interests of their own companies. And we've seen that the U.S. imposed sanctions against Russian companies also in the energy sector. But what they've seen is they saw ExxonMobil quitting some very favorable contracts, apart from one project in the Far East that they have been participating for a very long time. Well, who benefited from that? Nobody. The gas prices have skyrocketed. And we see situations in the oil market that the U.S. is suffering from, first and foremost. So the result is not just zero, it's actually negative for those imposing those sanctions. And I do believe that finally the understanding that uh, sanctions policy is not leading us anywhere. And I hope that Gradio will be able to recover our relationship. I just want to bring in our panelists to this conversation. Um, Darren, specifically with you, when we're talking about the investment um, that's needed in the oil and space, we're talking about um, half a trillion dollars that's been projected. Um, the IEA in the report today essentially saying that while we need threefold investment in green energy, we also, of course, need more energy investment, particularly in the oil and gas space. Um, at what point do you think that prices in terms of oil prohibit that in the sense that we have demand destruction? Good afternoon, Hadley, and, and everyone on the panel, and Mr. President. Uh, pleasure to be back uh, with the conference today, uh, albeit remotely. You know, I think that's the challenge in this industry and, and the things this panel has been talking about in the discussions that you've been having with the president is the challenges associated with balancing uh, the desire to move to lower emissions energy systems while at the same time meeting the critical needs of populations around the world and the recognition that, that energy plays such an important role in people's lives and, and growing prosperity. I think you know one point that's often missed um, as you think about the oil and gas markets is uh, around the world as we all produce these products, um, the supply declines and investments required to offset that decline. So even at a stable or flat uh, market, you still have to generate uh, enormous amounts of investments to fulfill and to, to backfill the decline in the production as you produce these supplies. And one of the challenges that the world is seeing, and in fact, I think a big contributor, or at least a, a significant contributor to what we're seeing in Europe and around the world in the gas markets is with the pandemic and the low prices and the impact it's had on the economy, a lot less investment has gone into replacing those uh, depleting uh, supplies. And as a result of that, a lot less product is available to meet this now rapid growth that we're seeing coming out of the pandemic. And so uh, I think as, as we've seen historically in these commodity markets, um, prices will rise uh, to incentivize additional supplies until that supply and demand meets. And oftentimes with these uh, capital intensive industries, more supply comes on than the growth in demand and you start to see some, some price uh, decline. And so I think we're gonna continue to see um, that balance and this, that supply demand balance working across the world markets. And um, I think as policies around the world change and uh, governments look to try to reduce um, uh, the, the, the economy's uh, dependence on oil and gas, that has the potential to, to make a point that Bernard uh, was making, was if we don't balance the demand equation and only address the supply, it will lead to additional volatility uh, with uh, creating additional imbalances. So I think the real challenge for, for everyone around the world um, is one, to work collaboratively, but two, to make sure that we've got good, thoughtful policies that recognize the importance of the energy people's lives and then figure out how you thoughtfully manage this transition uh, with the redundancy and some of the backup that the other uh, panelists have uh, points have made When we talk about this a little bit more broadly, I want to bring in um, uh, Patrick on this one as well. How tough is it to make those kinds of strategic investment decisions that we're talking about, billions of dollars in terms of, uh, we're talking years, 
when you have an administration to administration change in the United States with a completely different energy policy. Does that impact your long-term thinking, Patrick, when you're uh, looking for partnerships in the United States? Not in the United States. The United States is a, is a country where we produce LNG and we invest in renewables. I think, uh, I think what just Darren is just fundamental. I think the real challenge for all of us is that today the present of the planet, the energy of the present, is for 80% hydrocarbons and coal, uh, fossil fuels. That's the reality of the planet. And at the same time, so we must continue to, to invest in order to provide the energy needed by the population of the planet. That's the first mission. But at the same time, we must accelerate uh, in order to decarbonize the energy, to reinvent the energy. So we must invest more and more in decarbonized energies, in particular renewables. This is exactly what, why we move from total to total energies. We decided to change the name of the company, not only because to, to not only for greenwashing, but because strategically we have decided that we allocate only 75% of our capital expenditures per year to maintain all production and continue to grow in gas, and in particular in LNG, because again, gas, we believe strongly that gas is part of the energy transition. So no more growth in oil, but energy transition. And at the same time, 25% are dedicated to build a, a new business within our company, which is based on renewable electricity. And so, of course, we see a lot of policies around the world, not only in the US, but in many countries, which encourage uh, to invest in renewable electricity. And we are willing to become, and our objective is to become among the top five producers of renewable power by 2030. We have a clear roadmap, or we will have 35 gigawatts by 25. And so we do that because there is a lot of support. And uh, I think there is a big case in particular, even in producing countries. We just announced a very large project in Iraq, which is not only developing gas, which is flare today to make it a fuel for gas fired power plant and oil, but also solar. Because in fact, it's a way when you produce uh, renewable electricity in a country like that to to fulfill a higher demand for electricity and also uh, to make to, you can monetize the gas to other uses. So I think this is uh, our strategy. And but again, it's to find the right balance. And the IEA announcement today was interesting because at the same time uh, there is a, net zero, a famous net zero scenario of IEA which told us don't invest more in hydrocarbons, stop investing in your project. But today, because of the reality of the demand. This new report says on one side, invest more and more in renewables, and they are right, and we are taking our share as total energies. But at the same time, you need to invest more in oil and gas, just because, as Darren explained, there is a natural decline. If we do not invest, the decline year, by year after year is 3 to 4 percent. Today, it's not true, but the demand is declining. Today, the demand continues to even increase after the COVID. And so there is not, if we do not fulfill this gap between the natural demand and the natural decline of the supply and the real demand, then the price will continue to go up, which is not in the interest of the consumers. So this is a clear challenge. Investing enough in the energy of the present and investing more and more to build the new and future energy system. I think the report you were referring to uh, was the one that His Royal Highness Prince Abdulaziz um, referred to as La La Land not too long ago. Um, President Putin, when you think about this with regards to Russia's commitments on the climate change agenda, are you planning to attend COP26? Well, I have not. Uh decided on that yet uh, due to the pandemic situation but still i will participate in the work of the cop 26. i am not sure whether i will uh, go there and uh, participate in it personally but i will definitely participate in it Uh, you know, there was a case once when I uh, was almost contracted COVID-19, was uh, when I was in close contact uh, with my colleagues uh, who got COVID-19, but that didn't happen uh, due to the production that uh, 
I got thanks to Sputnik V vaccine, but that's not about me. In fact, when I go somewhere, I'm accompanied by many people, on over 100 people, including press service, uh, safeguards, um, drivers, uh, protocol, many other things. That's a big number of people that uh, are somehow exposed. Uh, and in this way, weeks in quarantine so I could be here. Walk us through the climate change commitments that you can make today for Russia, because at the end of the day, many people say this is a country that isn't doing enough, that they're not doing enough as Europe in terms of trying to get to net zero. In fact, Greta Thunberg recently put it as blah, 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 blah. How do you respond to that? Well, look, let us look at it without political cliches, but um, let's look at the developments in politics. You have said about Russia's uh, intention to increase uh, uh, gas supplies to Europe and to the world. Do you want this or not? If you do want, we need to extract gas to supply it somewhere. You didn't. You don't get electricity from a socket. You need a baseline source, and we need to get it to meet the growing demand of Russia and the global energy market. And let us look at the situation on the ground. We have increased gas supplies, and we have increased coal supplies to the global market by eight percent. By the way, in both directions, both eastward and westward. So we increased uh, um, uh, production by 5 or 8 percent, and export has also surged. So let us now look at our energy mix. 26 percent is uh, nuclear energy, then 20 percent is hydropower, 40 percent is gas. This is a very low carbon energy mix, 86%. The same energy mix, a clean energy mix, but not like that, but closer to ours. It's a United States energy mix. It's 77%. In the Federal Republic of Germany, it is 64% only. I mean, this clean energy mix. In other countries, it's even lower. Our energy mix is the cleanest, one of the cleanest, and we continue working in this direction to achieve carbon neutrality, not zero. By 2060, as other countries, uh, we will do that. And we are ready to do so. We have the same plans. We have plans envisaging that. And we have formulated tax preferences for the enterprises and energy and industrial sectors that will reduce emissions and launch renewable projects and hydrogen projects. We have program dedicated to, to that, I mean, the program of uh, tax stimulus. I believe that not only does Russia declare becoming a zero country, but it really follows this uh, um, route. We are not disregard uh, climate change problems. Uh, they are very important now. This is, was the start of our discussion, and uh, for Russia it's very crucial as well because uh, temperatures are rising very fast, including in the Arctic. We have cities there built on the permafrost. We are working in this direction. We are thinking about that. Several times today, just now and in your remarks earlier, do you believe it's a mistake for governments, uh, for example, for Germany, for other countries to move away from nuclear energy? I do not want to speak like that to blame someone as uh, some countries uh, 
blame us. Uh, it's not a mistake. Uh, is it a mistake or not? It's actually for uh, the Germans uh, to decide. And in our energy mix, uh, nuclear power generation account for 21 percent. Uh, if I um, said something else, uh, I'm, I was mistaken. And. Uh, 26% is the share of hydropower. And Germany decided to get away uh, from the nuclear energy. If you want to listen to my point of view, uh, I am not saying that it is a mistake or not. I can say that it is uh, senseless because France uh, is its neighbor, Germany's neighbor. And uh, nuclear power account for 60% uh, their why should Germany scale back all nuclear power generation project if uh, uh, France as a neighbor is engaged in um, such activities? In, well, if we take Russia, for example, which is very big, uh, and we can say that we will develop it in one part of the country and in uh, uh, another part, we are not going to do that. And uh, in Europe, uh, it's all cramped. Uh, countries are situated very close to one another. So we should speak about the general policy, energy policy of the uh, European Union, um, or it is just senseless uh, energy mix. Uh, well, I, I actually do not know um, the figures. It's uh, well, the colleague knows better. I think is it eleven in Germany? Eleven. Nuclear energy accounts for 11 percent of the energy mix, and it used to be over 30 percent. Well, now only 11 percent is left. Well, evidently, this is a big change, uh, and uh, this uh, energy resource should be replaced with uh, with something, with uh, windmills probably. Well, it's quite difficult, you know. Everything should be done smoothly and calmly in a well-balanced way and um, in a gradual way. Decisions should be made by experts, by professionals. I have recently learned, by the way, that in the Netherlands, the court has made a ruling about the Shell Company. What was that decision? What was the ruling? The court ruled to reduce uh, CO2 emissions by 45 percent. Well, you know, it's a precedent indeed. If people who are not experts in this area and if these people make decisions, we will have shocks in the markets. In the Middle Ages, it seems to me, when it was quite cold, um, climate conditions were uh, more severe. Um, the Netherlands citizens uh, uh, did uh, skating uh, on the channels. And uh, if uh, the situation continues to be like that, uh, uh, we will have um, skating there as well. Uh, they won't be able to uh, drive um, electric vehicles. Uh, they will put on the uh, skaters just to get warm and to move from point A to point B. What we need is uh, that professionals, experts, should make decisions in this sphere in close contact uh, with uh, non-governmental organizations, uh, with the civil society, which should keep an eye on the developments in this sphere. And uh, they should uh, make the government and energy companies uh, take the necessary route because uh, actually uh, our future depends on the temperature rise. Uh, but we need professional actions, actions made by professionals. And uh, we are now relying on luck. Uh, we take into account the political short-term goals and situation. It seems that uh, some participants, some actors, uh, uh, abuse uh, the confidence of the public to achieve short-term political goals and probably uh, to achieve some, to get some economic profits because uh, low carbon energy is connected with the development of some infrastructure, um, building equipment and so on. What we need is uh, that people, energy groups, civil societies should see 
uh, these problems and make decisions taking into account all the factors. Um, addition, um, I want to ask you about this proposed legislation um, by the EU that would basically ban drilling in the Arctic, oil and gas. Is that, in your view, a mistake? Because that would certainly hit the Russian economy pretty hard. Well, you see that if such decisions would lead to a certain spike in prices, then we would not suffer because we will cut our output, but in terms of prices, we will still get the revenue we counted on. So once again, such decisions should not be political. The relevant decisions should be made in close contact with experts and specialists in the area we are talking about. And then the necessary balance between green energy and the traditional energy sources will be found not to the detriment of consumers and people. Look, I've already talked about it and we've been talking about it for quite some time now that the prices are actually damaging for people, the end consumers. Our gas prices inside Russia for basic consumers stands at $64 per 1,000 cubic meters. For industries, it's 64 this is not 1,200 like spot prices in Europe. The economy is working dynamically, rhythmically. And by the end of this year, we can reach a record GDP growth. We have our own issues, yes, but this sets the conditions for development and this allows people to plan their life. Take Eastern Europe, for example, what's going on in Western Europe as well. Every month, they see record energy bills. In Ukraine, the same thing. For citizens, it's over $200 per 1,000 cubic meters. And their average income is around $230. So the consumers cannot buy a lot, so they do not coincide their income and the prices. Some regions there are even refusing to strike contracts to buy energy resources because they have nothing to pay for those contracts. And if we will take an imbalanced approach, then our problems would only multiply and no solutions will be found. Approach. Are you satisfied with the level of government um, support that you've seen in the UK specifically off the back of the energy crisis? Boris Johnson went on vacation. Is the UK government doing enough? I think um, the UK government is doing what it can. I think we talked about uh, this earlier and the situation here that we're facing in Europe and in the United Kingdom uh, is not just a UK issue, it's not just a European issue, this is a global issue. This is not an issue uh, that came up overnight. This is as a result of the things that we have uh, been talking about today, and it is a market at work, uh, but it is a market that has uh, had a confluence of events coming together, and without that redundancy in the system, and that's redundancy globally, uh, then I think you find uh, the situation that we have here today in Europe and indeed uh, in the UK. So uh, everybody is uh, doing their best uh, to respond, uh, ourselves included, um, but the reality is that this is not a, a crisis that is homegrown. This is the result of a global situation, and I go back to my earlier comments around investment. It requires investment into a number of things which will include uh, long-term contracts, investment into storage, I think you'll see more of that going forward. Investment, I think, into natural gas, which has to be uh, a part of the energy future, is a great form of stabilization and redundancy and investment into diversification. So there will undoubtedly be lessons to be learned uh, on the back of this, and uh, that's what we will see, I have no doubt, in the coming uh, weeks and months, Adley. 
Darren, if I could ask you that the same question in a sense, because obviously we talk about these long-term investments. We're talking about billions of dollars over several years. This isn't something um, that gets done in the short term. We know we need that investment. The IA has said that now as well. When you think about that with regards to the United States specifically, how difficult is it for you to forward plan when you have to worry about one change from one administration to another, which in the case of the Trump versus Biden team has been a drastically different approach to climate change? And that, that does make the a more challenging environment to, to plan in. I think, though, as you think about our industry and the time cycles that we all have to manage to, they extend well beyond any single administration. And so I think our company, along with many others in the industry, focus on what are the foundational drivers of how the economy is going to develop what's going to be required in the energy transition, uh, what technology breakthroughs are going to be needed, what those investment pro what are the practical investment profiles. And of course, we try to work with every administration that comes uh, in, in, into power uh, about policies, looking at policies that help them achieve those objectives to meet the, the demands of society for lower emissions uh, energy systems, while at the same time providing that more affordable um, energy and, and energy that's available and reliable. And so it's, I think you said many times you're on the panel, it's, it's how do you strike that balance? How do you effectively strike that balance? And uh, we'll have to continue to invest in the traditional sources and do that in a way um, that, that meets the needs of society while they work their way through this uh, transition, while they try to strike that balance. For us as a company, as we think about that, uh, Focusing and investing in what we think are the lower cost uh, supply sources. And so as demand uh, changes and, and uh, making sure that you're the low cost supplier in that market, I think brings some stability to the business. And then obviously working uh, with a lot of partners, not just the government, but private sectors, uh, universities, uh, think tanks in terms of understanding exactly how will this transition manifest itself with time. Because as we've talked about today, it is a complex system. It's a large system, and we're trying to make rapid changes in that system. And I think the real challenge here is how do you do that in a thoughtful way that uh, doesn't penalize uh, societies and, and, and achieves the objectives that we're searching for? So we're very thoughtful as we're thinking about where to allocate our capital, uh, putting money into technologies to try to advance those technologies that will achieve lower emissions at a lower cost so that we so society can afford to put those in and investing in low cost supply to continue to meet the needs of society while we're working through this very challenging and complex problem. Well, when you think about what's going to happen next within not just Mercedes-Benz, but Daimler as a whole, we've seen VW warning that there could be as many as 30,000 jobs at risk as a result of the energy crisis that we've seen. Um, can you give us an idea if we could see something similar happening within your group of companies? And at the same point, are you on track to electrify the fleet as promised by 2039? The industrial footprint of our company will change uh, as an effect of this. Uh, change over for combustion based technologies to uh, electric vehicles. So yes, over a longer period of time, there will be less jobs in that particular part of the business, but other sides of the business are growing significantly. Uh, we're investing into new technologies. Uh, the whole topic of high power computing and software architectures in vehicles is becoming more and more important. So at the same time as we will gradually rebuild our industrial footprint, we're growing in terms of jobs, uh, high quality jobs in other areas. So I think that can be managed, that transition. And with regard to our path towards 2039, absolutely, I think we can do that. In fact, uh, we're even upping the pace and we have made a decision that all new vehicle architectures from uh, 2025 forward will be designed uh, from the ground up as electric only. So over a longer period of time, you have already kind of put a, a time clock on, on how that transition is going to happen. And uh, the ultimate commitment of a company is allocating their capital and the energy resources or engineering resources rather towards the new technology. So yes, it's happening. Patrick, I want to ask you specifically about the Arctic. Um, when you think about this with regards to the melting permafrost um, and climate activism um, in terms of shareholders, uh, in terms of the board, 
there's a growing chorus of cacophony when it comes to ESG, when it comes to holding oil and gas companies accountable for where they invest and how they invest. How difficult does it make your job when Russia is labeled a bad actor by so many um, in the West? I, I, my answer is to first have a strong dialogue with all these uh, people, and I think the uh, best answer, by the way, would be to invite them to visit the plant that we have built together with Novatech in Russian Arctic. I can ensure you that, of course, we apply, as a global company, the same standards in terms of protection of the environment, in terms of safety for people, in terms of sustainability, in all the countries around the planet. And uh, in particular, looking to the Arctic, we took some commitments on total energies, which is that we are not producing any oil in the Arctic, because that might be, in case of spill, some clear damages. But producing gas in the Arctic, it does not raise this type of issues. And on the biodiversity case, we have been very transparent. We recently published all our studies that we've done for the Arctic 2 projects together with our partners. And we are applying the highest standards in terms of protection of biodiversity and also taking care of local communities. I would say it's one of the best examples. So maybe there is too much emotion today in the way we look to the planet. The question is, in fact, to, to rank the various priorities. Of course, biodiversity is important, like climate change is key for our future, and we must seriously consider them, but it does not mean that we will do, we'll solve this issue by exclusion, by banning. No, as we said during this panel, I think, the world needs more energy. So the question, of course, is to be able, and this is the mission of a company like Total Energies, like BP, like ExxonMobil, like all the companies in the energy field, to be able to produce this energy in the best standards in terms of sustainability. And this is our commitment. And I can tell you, we apply that in Russia. By the way, when we have some external financing coming from export credit agencies from Western countries, these are the highest ESG standards are required, are required by these financial institutions, and we apply them. So, uh, again, I think that it's important not to mix, I think, all the topics and uh, to look on the facts, to look on the ground, the way we manage these uh, developments. And again, this is a clear commitment, minimizing the impact. And again, we have been going further within Total Energies, as we said, that for all new greenfield projects, we will look to have a net positive gain on biodiversity. And we do not estimate that ourselves, but we do that with the experts. So again, I think this transition, as we said with the panel, is a huge task. Uh, willing to change the whole energy system will not happen like that. And the word transition is important. So it's not about antagonizing energies, antagonizing people, but we will build and we will me make this transition a success. It's only if everybody, like Darren suggests, is around, sits around the table and not with emotion, not by saying you are right or well, it's black and white. No, let's look to the facts and then let's see the way that we can improve. And we are sustainably, we don't say that we are perfect, we just say that it's a continuous improvement. We learn from experts, we learn, we learn from NGOs, and we are willing to take their advice on board, providing it's not a matter of just saying it's an exclusion. That will not be, a, we will not build the planet with such uh, positioning. President Putin, you've said you're not sure yet whether you'll attend COP26, but I want to get a sense from you of how you see um, the structure for climate change in terms of policy. Should this be um, a UN of climate in terms of all of these nations coming together and setting global policies? Should this be done at a regional level? How should this look in the future, in your view? So the question is, what international legal mechanisms should be created? As I've just said, in terms of oil production, 
and working on global markets. We have very constructive relations with OPEC countries. And the mechanism that is in place, OPEC Plus, is very efficient and it considers the interest of the entire global energy system. And I believe that once we reach the pre-crisis level in terms of output, we will continue working on green policies as well. We will discuss modern technologies for oil production and for using hydrocarbons. We will discuss moving on to using hydrogen and renewables as well. This is the first thing I wanted to say. And the second is we have uh, uh, the international gas producers group, the G20, the United Nations, all those uh, organizations that deal with climate change, of course, we need to discuss this very topic there. This should be one of the main topics to be discussed, not from the point of view of, oh, we are suffering so much from it, but in terms of what we need to do so that the interests, or the economic interest and the people's interest and everybody's interest would um, find some common ground and create the proper conditions for a green economy. When producers of uh, cars, car makers, have to switch to EVs, it's good because cars are one of the major polluters. That's good and that's for the best. But the primary source, as I've mentioned, electricity doesn't come directly from a socket. Germany, for example, in its energy mix has 35 percent, 33 to 35 percent of coal generation. That is the most polluting uh, source of generation. Then you can produce as many EVs as you want, but coal generation would have its own effect, negative effect on the environment, and would increase the number of emissions. However, gas, gas does not lead to such a negative effect. You how do we hold these various governments accountable in terms of that accountability? You said China fulfills their commitments. You said you're on track to fulfill yours. How do we hold various governments accountable? Because that's what people want. Governments should be accountable inside their own countries and when developing single um, standard for environmentally friendly behavior. This can be achieved when the decisions taken are just. Then those concerns of the entire humanity on climate change would not be used for somebody's narrow political goals. When under the motto of preserving the environment, someone would try to gain advantage over somebody else, that's not good. So we need to find a platform and to develop transparent approaches to making final decisions. And this is when we are going to move in the right direction when it comes to climate agenda. If this will not happen, then we will face some imbalances, like we see the imbalance on the gas market in Europe. And in the end, the situation uh, when it comes to climate change would not change for the better. You then has uneven climate change policies, whether it be in Europe or the United States, given the West less leverage in these kinds of conversations, particularly when it comes to OPEC, OPEC plus decisions? What we are seeing and hearing today coming from the EU regarding the carbon border adjustment tax, that is a cause for concern. Because if the decision is made unilaterally, if this is used as a tool for unfair competition, then in this case the result would be similar to the situation we see today. We would just see a price spike and that's it. The Americans decided to, to leave the European market or to lower the uh, supplies. They cut it by half. 
by 14 um, billion cubic meters, if we're talking about cubic meters. And that's it. The same thing is going to happen then if inadequate decisions are taken, then we will respond accordingly. You see, there are some competitive advantages that Russia has, considering we have great reserves of hydrocarbons. Yes, we do have those competitive advantages, but those are natural competitive advantages. And you should take it as a given. There is nothing that can be done about this. You should not invent some kind of mechanism to try to tackle those natural advantages and try to limit them in some way. You should be honest and open when it comes to dialogue, and we are prepared for that. President Putin, I can't help but sense a bit of animosity when it comes to your European partners. What could Europe do to fix that situation? We cannot say that we are dissatisfied with the situation in Europe. We see how the discussion goes. And it has proven that what's going on in the markets is a kind of a handmade situation with the result of heedless politics. But this is their problem. We are prepared to work in such a way as to avoid such crisis in future. We are open for a dialogue. We meet and we keep in touch and we work together with our partners. And the understanding that we need to advance this dialogue is there. So we need to see how that would be implemented in practice. The Europeans have a trust deficit with Russia, and it's not just because of this current crisis in the gas market. It's also, of course, the massing of 80,000, 100,000 Russian troops on the Ukrainian border. At what point do you believe that you will solve these issues with your European partners? Because it requires dialogue. Would you be willing to talk to NATO directly? Yes. We are willing to talk directly to NATO in particular. As far as our soldiers go, they are stationed in the Russian territory. We conducted military exercises, West 2021, a large scale military exercise, but we conducted that on our territory. Our American counterparts are also engaged in um, exercises as large scale as that, but thousands of kilometers from their national territory. It is not we who came somewhere near Washington and New York to conduct military exercises. They do that very close to our borders. And we have to respond to that. And we conduct our own military exercises. But I would like to reiterate in our national territory. And there is nothing surprising about that. And I'm not going to report about that to anyone. Our partners are undermining all agreements which we reached in the past, in particular on confidence building measures in Europe. I refer in particular to NATO's expansionist words, something I have spoken on many occasions before. There is also the imbalance with the Baltic states, which are taken out of any kind of count as far as the military contingent goes. We are not in violation of anything. We have not withdrawn from the ABM, nor have we been the ones to abandon the INF Treaty, nor we who quit the Open Skies Treaty. It was our American counterparts who did that. But in order to shift the blame, they are simply shifting it on others. And the media are blowing it out of proportion in the interest of those who are paying for that. So there is nothing surprising about that in the world. But we are going to do what we deem necessary to protect our interests and to ensure our security. And I assume missile that flies at Mark 3 and is <coughs> precision guided. <coughs> Well, no, not three mark. I think three mark is what the U.S. is doing even more than. Our hypersonic weapons flies at more than 20 mark, and these are not just hypersonic weapons, anti-continental weapons, and far more serious than the ones that you've just mentioned, and we've already entered them into 
service and other partners are pursuing similar systems as well and there is nothing surprising about that either because high technology armies across the world will acquire such weapon systems in the very near future but i would like to draw attention to the fact that having access to such weapon systems for the first time in history being ahead of our main competitor in that field in terms of high technology weapon systems we're not trying to take advantage of that. We're not trying to threaten anyone. Moreover, we're willing to engage in talks on reducing offensive weapon systems. And based on the interest from the Americans, we are willing to take into account the fact that we have such weapon systems and we could take that into account in negotiations. We should stop with all this blah blah and we have to sit down and talk in a substantive manner and as far as I understand the current American administration is uh, trying to embark on this path and our contacts are developing incidentally uh, this is something our meeting with Biden was uh, it, uh... I have to say that unfortunately it is an arms race in full swing, and it started once the U.S. withdrew from the ABM Treaty. I would like to draw your attention to the fact that back in 2003, I told our partners, I, I told them, do not do that. Please do not quit the ABM Treaty because it's a fundamental thing. It's a cornerstone of international security. What is an ABM system? An anti-ballistic missile system is not just about protection. It is also about trying to gain a strategic advantage by eliminating the nuclear potential of uh, a potential adversary. What are we supposed to do in response? I said that on many occasions. We either have to create a similar system which would have cost us a whole load of money and with no guaranteed result, or we could create another system which would be 100% sure to overcome the ABM system. And I said we would do that. And our American counterpart said, our ABM is not aimed against you. Do what you want. And we will assume that it is not against us either. And we, we did that. So what complaints are there? And I, I don't, they are not happy with that. They say you have this and this type of weapon. And uh, we, we say we didn't like it when you withdrew from the ABM treaty. We were not the ones to stop that. But right now, we have to accept the realities for what they are, and we have to engage in constructive talks accordingly. President Putin, before I let you go, I just want to ask you to walk us through what's happening in Russia today, because at the end of the day, you do have a problem because you have real incomes that have fallen for five of the last seven years. The average Russian has 11 percent less to spend in terms of their buying power than they did in 2013, and you've got a declining population. Also, of course, 10 percent of your GDP is made up of what is extracted from uh, the Arctic, and of course the permafrost is melting. Um, so you do have some serious um, economic issues and challenges. You also have the structural issues to the economy related to oil and gas, to Petros, that you've talked about so many times in the past. Ronald Reagan said that freedom is prosperity. Freedom is prosperity. When you think about that with regards to modern democracy in Russia, in the past you've made comments to the effect that Russia wasn't ready for full democracy. Where are we today, in your view, in Russia? Well, honestly, I do not remember ever saying that Russia is not uh, ready for a full democracy because democracy, well, it can be interpreted differently. There is freedom of uh, speech, freedom of religion, freedom of organization, association, freedom of mass events in the streets when in Europe or in the U.S. all kinds of mass Events are dispersed with the use of uh, tear gas and uh, raising bullets. Uh, is it freedom or not? I think you're right to react the way you did. It doesn't look very much like freedom. Democracy and freedom cannot but be tied to the culture and traditions of uh, specific people. Well, 
the U.S. came to Afghanistan with no due regard for the culture or the history of the Afghan people, and you see that the outcome was tragic. There's a great the spread of uh, terrorism across the region and the world is accelerating because in the past they didn't take into account the realities that existed in that country. And the same goes for any country, Russia included. If we talk about developing democracy in Russia, we've got to have in mind Russia's culture, traditions, and particular traditions of parliamentarians because the parliamentary tradition in Russia uh, is 100 years long and we've got a new uh, faction in parliament. Everything has to develop in a steady, stable manner without any outbursts, outpourings of negative emotions. Everything has to guarantee the protection of our people's interests. And the political system of Russia is also developing steadily to prevent any other kind of revolution because, well, we've run out of our limit for revolutions. We need a steady environment that would guarantee the rights and freedoms of our citizens and also a steady development of uh, social field and also our economy. This is the path we are pursuing today and we hope we'll pursue it further. Now, uh, I think uh, accusations that democracy in Russia is uh, dead, well, these sayings are overblown. That is what uh, Mark Twain said in response to hearsay about his alleged death. I think parliamentarianism in Europe is suffering grave problems in Europe today. Look at traditional parliamentarian countries, look at what is happening there, how authorities are formed there, how many corruption scandals, what is happening to lobbyism. What is this lobbyism, official lobbyism in the US? It is legalized corruption. And I think everyone understands that, but everyone keeps mum about that. What about this indirect vote for the president in the US? And I think this happened three times already when a person came into power uh, who got less, fewer votes than their competitor because of this indirect system of voting. Uh, we have flaws in our system too, but this doesn't mean that these flaws are more numerous than in your countries. Maybe they are even less numerous. Now, a couple of words about the economy. Yes, our economy is suffering from some problems, and just that's true as elsewhere in the world. The income of our population is going down, and we are concerned about that, and we are trying to ensure economic growth on the one hand. At the same time, we're trying to make sure that this results in an increase in real income for our people. This requires a great deal of administrative and financial resources. So far, we have not succeeded entirely, but we understand what people need government support, and that is why we provide targeted support, we provide targeted income for families with children, for senior citizens. We're doing that in a precision targeted manner. And yes, unfortunately, inflation rate has gone down, I think, uh, uh, gone up at 7.5 percent or so. It's higher than we expected, but you said it yourself. All banks across the world are printing money. Our central bank does not do that. Just yesterday, I met the governor of the Central Bank of Russia, and we spoke about our financial policies. Our bank is not printing new money, but we are part of the world system. And our food prices have gone up even by more than 7.5%. But what about the rest of the world? Across the world, due to a number of different reasons, in particular due to the recent events in the energy markets, the prices have gone up too. Yes, we are part of the world system. We have problems of our own. But And with the support of the Russian citizens, we will address these problems. We are certain of that. Mr. President, at the same time, though, corruption is still a big problem in Russia. You said at 129 out of 180 nations in terms of the corruption index. When you came to the presidency, you made a massive cleanup of the Yeltsin-era oligarchs, if you will, of those who took advantage of the breakup of the Soviet Union for ill-gotten gains. But corruption flourishes where there's a disregard for human rights. 
in your view, with regards to human rights in Russia, is it normal that you have the kind of abuses that we see today, that journalists are labeled as foreign agents? Your Nobel Prize winner is worried that he's going to be labeled as a foreign agent. Is that normal to you? I do not think that it is normal when there are persecutions against journalists. Incidentally, if we have a look at the numbers of journalists who have suffered across the world, uh, you'll see the statistics. Unfortunately, Russia is not the only country where this is happening. And, well, yes, this is a result of internal development of the country and democratic processes. But it is in v very uh, hard to find any other country where the media are funded from the uh, government but are so intransigent about the uh, government policies. You know, there is uh, Gazprom media in our country, and it has a very intransigent position what the government is doing. Even though they get uh, government funding and they're working and everything is fine. Yes, sometimes journalists uh, can overstep the boundaries. They uh, run against certain risks. And our goal is to protect them. Unfortunately, we do not always succeed. That's true. Mr. Movitov, your Nobel Prize winner, will not be labeled as a foreign agent. Well, if he is in compliance with the Russian legislation, if he doesn't do anything that would give us grounds to label him as a foreign uh, agent, then everything is going to be fine. And if he tries to use the Nobel uh, Peace Prize just uh, as a shield, then uh, and he does something that is not in compliance with the Russian legislation, then, well, uh, this would mean a deliberate provocation. Everyone should understand that Russian legislation, Russian law has to be observed. Now, as far as the foreign agent law is concerned, we're not the ones to devise it. It was devised back in the 1930s in the US, and it is still in force, and it is also applied in particular with regard to the Russian media in the US. So why is the US allowed to do that, whereas we are not. We do that with one single purpose, to protect our internal political processes from external interference. Foreign agents are not barred from political activities or from any other professional activities. They only have to register as such, whereas in the U.S. they face all but uh, criminal charges for that. We know what we're doing and we will do what is in line with the Russian interests. Final question, Mr. President, with regards to this specifically, I mean, you're ex-KGB. Is there really a fifth column in Russia led by the likes of Alexei Navalny that you're so worried about? What is it? What is it that worries you so much about those in the opposition that you have to jail them? Well, if you take a look at the street protests, you will be able to understand that by far not of all of them are in prison. People who work there do not violate the laws. As for the persons you've mentioned, they are in prison not for political activities. They are there for the crimes they've committed, including against the foreign entrepreneurs who are doing business in Russia and several times, by the way. That has happened several times. So, in fact, we have forgiven them for those three passing several times. And you have to be aware of the consequences of that type of tree passing. So, you certainly should not abuse the trust of the society in order to achieve certain economic advantages by pretending and using the political activity as a cover-up. And that relates to the particular person you refer to. As for the opposition in general, I would say the political opposition in Russia exists. It works. It criticizes the uh, 
uh, ruling power and it criticizes the current political power very rigidly, sometimes much more rigidly than it is done in other countries. You can compare it to other media. That is what happening from the side of the Russian opposition and Russian media. They work fine. More than that, some of them are even getting financing from Gazprom, like I said. Gazprom is selling gas to Europe and is financing opposition media in Russia. If you haven't heard about that, I'm very happy to inform you. Please note that as well. Then you would understand a lot of things. It certainly hasn't kept some of the far panelists from investing in Russia. Folks, unfortunately, I'm getting the rap sign, so I'm going to have to leave it there. 20th anniversary of Russian Energy Week. Mr. President, thank you so much for joining us, panels as well. Everybody have a great day and enjoy the conference. Yeah. I also would like to thank our moderator. I believe Hadley has created a very special atmosphere here. And I also would like to thank our colleagues and our friends from the energy companies who have made it possible despite a very tense schedule. I know that you are very busy at the moment. You are very busy in your countries, but you also represent global companies. You have businesses all around the world and you have to take care about a lot of things. So we very much appreciate it that you have been able to join us at this session. And I very much hope that those of you who are with us remotely and those of you who have managed to come to Moscow, those of you who are in this room, just like before, despite all the difficulties that we're all facing today, in the world of energy sphere, I do hope that you will continue your fruitful businesses and I'd like to assure you on my side, on the side of the Russian government and your humble servant will do everything possible in order to create the right conditions for you to do business in Russia, to make sure it is based according to the highest environmental standard, but at the same time, it is important that you get maximum profitability for your companies. A lot has been done by us already during the previous years, and I'm quite convinced that even more will be done in the interest of world energy sphere in the future. And certainly we'll do more for the countries where we operate. So thank you very much for your participation. Thanks a lot.